Hey, Randy Joe here, and this is 1001 Reviews, the series where I plan on reviewing every single album from the 1001 albums listened to Before You Die book. And today we are looking at Public Images Limited 1978 album, Public Image Limited, the self titled debut. Public Image Limited released this underneath the Virgin label, produced by Public Image Limited themselves, with art direction from Terry Jones, Dennis Morris, and PIL, nationality UK, and a running time of 39 minutes and 55 seconds. I'm gonna get real tired of saying Public Image Limited real fast. I'm pretty unfamiliar with this band other than the fact that I know um, the front man of Sex Pistols is the front man of this band, and this is essentially the successor to Sex Pistols, and I know that this is a post-punk album, which is a genre I typically enjoy. At 39 minutes long, let's not waste any time, and we'll jump right into this with the first song, Theme. Kicks off with a scream. I really like this opening. Kind of reminds me of um, Iggy Pop's The Idiot. Jesus. That wailing. Very slow build in post punk fashion. Especially at the time. I switched out for a more appropriate album in the background. Kind of reminds me of mass production from The Idiot, which is a great song. That wailing feedback. John Lydon is um, very visceral, as usual. I like that that gentle like bass line background. <laughs> Jesus. Such an atmospheric track. You know? In typical post-punk fashion, the atmosphere feels like it comes before the lyrics. Um, which is a great thing, I think, for the genre. I wonder how much of this was like improv and done on the spot. Because with the nature of it, it feels as if it would work as a um, just jam session. His vocals are mixed so low and, and they're so throaty when they do come through. Um, again, in your typical John Lydon fashion. Wonder what he wishes for, guys. Oh, I like this outro. Oh. Has something resembling um, optimism there for a moment. All right, for the first track, um, instantly hit with what is very clearly post-punk. Um, and this feels almost like a continuation of what one can expect from the genre, given uh, Iggy Pop's The Idiot in the background there. Um, feels very familiar in style and sound to that record, which, again, makes sense, given that that is a uh, post-punk album as well. And... Honestly, I'm here for it. I love post-punk, and I think this song is a great example of it. With the uh, atmosphere being such an important aspect, and the very dark and almost dreary sort of tone to it, and again, the vocals feeling very pained and wailing by John Lydon here, as he wails out very clearly um, in this raspy, guttural voice, I wish I could die. Not music, I guess, for the faint of heart at the time, and would definitely even today be considered something a little more out there to the general public. I like this opener though. It's a great way to kick things off. Really sets the tone. Uh, I'm gonna give that one an 8.5 out of 10. Um, after that nine minutes and 10 second track, we're going on to the second track, which is a stark contrast with only a minute and 26 seconds on this song. Um, Religion One. Let's go ahead and see where that's gonna go because you know, short songs in post-punk is less common than than long songs so let's go uh, kick it off stained glass windows keep the cold outside while the hypocrites hide in vocals with the this is gonna be a vocal only type thing in those dead in the Irish post you give away the cash you can't afford John Lydon being offensive 
which is not unheard of for the man. Never afraid of uh, bad publicity, I guess. Since that was a vocal only track and feels more like a skit as a precursor to Religion 2, uh, I'm not going to give that a rating, but very clearly um, a point being made against Religion here by John Lydon. Hmm, it's all mixed in this year right now. There it is. Okay, I see. Taking the vocals from the previous track and inserting them now. <laughs> I really like that riff. Ooh. Really just all mixed in there on the both ears. That one. Oh. I, I already know where this rating's going, by the way. It's all mixed back into the right ear. The production on this track is very interesting. It's rough and visceral. Um but the mixing, I'm not sure if that's intentional, but it's it's very strange for sure. He's all in this year, and the instrument is all in this year. Kind of reminds me of the gift from Velvet Underground. Mm, I love that. As it all comes together there, it's such a nice way to introduce everything. I'm not sure what that frantic string instrument is there maybe it's some sort of harp being played quite frantically I'm not sure but it gives off a very horror and and thriller induced type vibe it is so eerie in its tone um, and given the denouncing of religion here kind of plays into almost like a religious horror aspect it's very nice though Na, 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 na. It's hard to react to a song like that or to most post-punk, you know, giving a live reaction. It's much easier to say what I think after the fact, which is this is a very um, clearly offensive anti-Christian track, um, very blatantly pointing out the flaws of Christianity and the hypocritical nature of Christianity. And to do such a, to, to say such a thing when you're such a public figure is already such a bold take. I mean, this could have just completely destroyed the band, um, but at the same time, it really kind of puts forward what this band is trying to do. It's it's breaking a certain ground that the Sex Pistols wouldn't even touch. So I would say this this track lyrically already stands out as something very um, bold and unique, and I really enjoy it for that. But sonically the production here is very different it's it's not what one would expect as it kind of mixes back and forth from left to right and kind of comes together throughout multiple moments of the track in a way that feels very unified i i don't really know what the intention is of it i'm not even sure if i particularly like it um what the way it does that but i do enjoy the basic nature of this track and it's very heavy um, focus on the riff and the bass line that is the groundwork of this track. Like I typically am with a lot of post-punk tracks that focus on a very simplistic riff that everything is laid upon. I typically like that with most music actually and with Religion 2 um, it definitely focuses on that just as theme did. So I'm gonna go ahead and give Religion 2 a 9 out of 10. I really enjoyed it. Um, Aside from me still being unsure of the, you know, almost like binaural recording type uh, aspect, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But other than that, this is a great song. I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Next track, we have Annalisa. Uh, six minutes long. I'm going into this completely um, just, just unaware of what to expect. Much punchier, more upbeat than what one expect from this band so far. Hold on. I feel like I need to address the background of this track from what I just read. This is based on the story of uh, Annalisa Michael or Michelle, who was a German woman who was put through um, many 
satanic sort of uh, cleansing rituals or exorcisms by her parents because they believed she was possessed by the devil. And through this, she was put through 67 exorcism rituals. And in the course of this, she was forced to stop eating and eventually died from dehydration and starvation at the hands of her parents when she was only 23 years old, um, which is already a pretty uh, rough story and for public image to tackle such a dark story, which took place like literally in the 70s, two years prior to this song coming out, she died. So a very hot topic at the time of recording this for public image to take on such a topic is again very interesting and also carrying on the themes of religion from the previous track into this one as the satanic rituals by her parents clearly they are uh, a little bit of religious zealots let's continue i feel like that was important to know that drumming is great instrumentally this is incredible Very um, clearly against religion with that line. Continuing the theme. Jesus Christ. Clearly told from the perspective of Annalisa on this track um, towards her parents. <sighs> Disturbing. That was disgusting. I'm going to give that a nine again carrying on themes of religion with that track um this is a very offensive album from public image really just making their public image uh one to be highly inspected and scrutinized by the public while at the same time making a very visceral anti-religion stance and with that being said, let's go on to the title track, which has the highest streams here, 8.8 .8 million plays at the time of recording this. Um, at three minutes, this is a more accessible length, at least one would say. Let's go ahead and see what the song sounds like. I don't imagine it's going to be that accessible, given the nature of the band. A lot of effects also played into the, the pedals here, too, on the guitars. Very, very washy guitars and very echoey guitar work. A track where John Lydon is speaking about um, his ex-manager, I guess, Malcolm McLaren, as well as the Sex Pistols, as they, he felt he was only used uh, as an image for the band rather than an actual useful tool to the band. They didn't pay attention to his lyrics. They didn't pay attention to what he was saying. Uh, they just cared about what he looked like, given public image. Kind of makes sense. <laughs> I kind of like the message here that John Lydon's putting out, taking control of his own image. Huh. I like the message of that one. I like John Lydon's approach here as he takes back his image from Malcolm McLaren, who is notorious for being a bit of a control freak um, and one who, you know, doesn't seem like the greatest person to work with if you want to uh, actually be respected in any way. And if we're going to take what John Lydon's saying at face value, then... It's very clear that uh, the management of Sex Pistols was quite awful. That is definitely the most accessible track so far and the most punk track, dropping the post-punk aspects and going more towards what uh, John Lydon was known for. Maybe that's just a way to you know, put out this single and kind of make a name for himself a bit easier. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go ahead and give that one a 7. It's not personally my favorite so far, and I feel like it steps too far away from the post-punk aspects that I've enjoyed so far, um, but still a pretty good punk track at the very least. Uh, a 7 out of 10, I give it. Next, we have the song Low Life, which is either about Malcolm McLaren or Sid Vicious. Um, given John Lydon's distaste for both of them, 
could be either or. Um, but John Lennon has gone on record to say that Sid Vicious is the worst type of rock star and has also very clearly, especially from the last one, spoken against Malcolm McLaren as just a general human being. Um, but yeah, low life, let's go. I assume it's about both, given verse 2 seems more about Sid and verse 3 seems more about uh, Malcolm McLaren, John Lydon flinging shit at two people at once in one track. Quite impressive. I love how petty John Lydon's coming across on, the, on this track and the last one especially. Always a fan of petty lyrics and snide remarks. I like that. The drumming in this track is, um, again, visceral as always, but I like that tinging sound that's being put in here. Okay, continuing on with John Lydon's um, hatred for the band, I give that one a 7. I'm not enjoying the second side of this record as much as the first side. Still very quality punk tracks being put forth here. Low Life gets a 7. Next we have Attack, the least streamed song. Oh. It's a repulsive intro. It's important to note that the guitar work throughout this album um, is done by Ken Levine from The Clash, who is obviously, you know, another well-renowned, well-respected punk band at the time. Um, it's clear that the, the meeting of two great punk minds came together here to put together post-punk. Imagine a record done by every great post-punk artist. That would have been something else. I would have loved a collaboration with Iggy Pop, quite honestly. But still carrying on, uh, just important to note that the guitar work on this whole album is done by the Clash member, uh, Keith Levine. Also, I'm going to assume that the lyrics are about Malcolm McLaren. Again, a lot of hatred from Barry Lydon towards uh, Sex Pistols and Malcolm McLaren especially coming through here. Attack, maybe the weakest one. I, I don't know. I'm not, again, not feeling the second side as much, but I gotta say, Attack still carrying on that very visceral, rough, angry uh, production, rather, not percussion. Um, although the percussion here is also pretty rough. But everything here is very clearly fueled by the uh, hatred that John Lydon has towards X manager Malcolm McLaren from the Sex Pistols. It's very clear through these lyrics how much he hates the man. Um, but again, post-punk nature coming through here with its very just angry, dark atmosphere. I'm going to give Attack uh, a 6.5. A little disappointed that the second half of this record is not coming through as strong as the first half, but uh, hopefully this final track here at 7 minutes long, almost 8 minutes, Fodder Stomp will pull through with just the best track um, on the album. I mean, if it's anything like the first half, then we have a winner here to close things out. Fodder Stomp, though, uh, let's get into it. The final post-punk track here. Let's see how it sounds. Already sounding very different from what I've come to expect. This is way more like a beat almost hip-hop in style i'm not really sure what i'm hearing at all <laughs> that's such a funny line they're quite this is like the music equivalent of just jerking off this is a hilarious track not very a um this is not really a real song this is clearly a joke made to pad out time. They're literally just fucking around in the studio at this point. They're literally just having a conversation. There's nothing to this. It's a it's a joke. I don't even know how to review something like this. Is he gonna do it? <laughs> Quite literally spraying a fire extinguisher in into the mic here. Fodder stomp is exactly what it sounds like. Fodder there to pad out time and essentially just finish the contractual obligation here 
that is to reach a certain um, time limit for the album. It is seven and a half minutes of the band just jerking off, essentially, just fucking around on the mic and not being very serious. Um, it makes for a lot of very humorous moments on here and is definitely very punk with its just concept, really. I mean, this is how, how do you get more punk than essentially just not doing your job and screwing around and screwing over a contract? You know, essentially a novelty track. Will I ever listen to it again? Most likely not, maybe only as a joke, as it is humorous. But other than that, I don't think I would ever listen to this in any serious context, obviously. I don't even know how to rate something like that. It feels like a really long, drawn-out skit. I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7.5 just for its very idea and context here. It is quite literally the most punk one might be able to get. Um, at one point, he literally sprays a fire extinguisher into into the mic here. So there's clearly no care put into this track. Um, yeah, 7.5. And that pretty much does it for the listening portion of this reaction. Um, so let's go ahead and just, I'm going to say my final thoughts, which is that as far as po post-punk goes, um, it's not as good as, you know, this masterpiece in the background here, the album that I gave a true 10 to on this channel. Um, but it is still a very tried and true post-punk album, especially the time when this genre was just kicking off. And I really enjoy the first half of this album quite thoroughly. There's no track in the first half that I disliked. Nor do I any, not, not that I disliked anything in the second half, I just think that it kind of ventures off into more just punk and less post-punk and doesn't stick um, quite as well as the first half. I like the attacking of religion in the first half and the theme of religion kind of carrying out through the first half, but again that gets dropped entirely for John Lydon essentially just attacking ex-bandmates in the second half, which as petty, as enjoyable as that is, it kind of runs out of steam by the time it gets to attack, where it just feels like he is kind of phoning it in, which couldn't be any more true um, once it gets to the last track. You know, Fodder Stomp is quite literally a, dr a joke, you know, there to pad out time. So I'm going to go ahead and say that this gets a soft rating of 7.9 out of 10 and a hard rating of 8 out of 10. Um, whether or not it's essential or not essential is much harder for me to pin down because the first half of this I would say is absolutely essential whereas the second half I would say it's not essential which kind of makes this difficult as I have to give it one or the other um, but I think I'm gonna lean more towards essential so it gets an E for essential just given the fact that the post-punk nature of the first half is pretty kind of fresh and new at the time and is kind of an important development in the genre even if i think it's done better on the idiot and that pretty much does it for this review let's go ahead and see what the next album we're listening to is in the 1001 albums listened to before you die book random number generator 1 to 1001 generate number 47 where the fuck did that thing go Quite a low number, number 47 being the album. Buck Owens and his buckaroos, I've got a tiger by the tail. Never heard of the artist, never heard of the album. Think it's a country album, which seems like a pretty rare thing to get so far on this channel. So yeah, let's, uh, let's do it up for the next review. That pretty much does it for this video. If you like the video, please hit like and subscribe if you want to follow along and listen to every album from the 1001 albums listen to Before You Die book. And as always, my name is Randy Joe, and I am signing off. <laughs>